Welcome our dear uh, friends, colleagues, professors, and fellows all over the world. Today is our fourth webinar uh, in the series of uh, ACC 2020 guidelines, We four of sports and cardiology. It is our honor today to have uh, uh, two of the most eminent uh, speakers uh, and consultants of sports cardiology in Egypt and uh, internationally very well known, our dear professor, Dr. Yasser Ala. Dr. Yasser is a lecturer of cardiology at Ain Shams University and uh, a very well known consultant cardiologist and cardiovascular rehabilitation uh, program at Ain Shams University. And it is our honor also to introduce uh, our dear uh, friend, uh, Professor uh, Dr. Hani Shahidi. Uh, Dr. Hani is uh, the medical uh, training uh, director at National Heart Institute, and he is also uh, the head of uh, uh, training at National Heart Institute and the uh, deputy chairman of the medical committee of the Egyptian Football Association. And also he is one uh, uh, or he is the coordinator of uh, American Heart Association uh, in Egypt. Welcome, uh, dear Professor uh, Dr. Ala and uh, Dr. Hani. Uh, this meeting will be elegantly moderated uh, uh, by my dear friend, Professor Dr. Mohammed Zahran. Uh, I will pass the mic to Dr. Zahran, Zahran first, and then to uh, Dr. Yasser and Dr. Hani to give, off, uh, give us a very few words before we start our webinar. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, for this uh, nice introduction. Uh, Dr. Yasser uh, first uh, will start about uh, uh, the introduction and the risk stratification and the classification according to the new SCC guidelines. And then uh, Dr. Hani Shahidi will give us a very interesting uh, case-based, uh, actually real-life scenarios that met him during his practice. And then he will incorporate us interactively through the guidelines step-by-step step until we reach uh, the desired uh, decision-making and management. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, everyone. Uh, before Dr. Yasser starts, maybe we can hear a couple of words from Dr. Haney and then Dr. Yasser will have the stage. Uh, Dr. Haney. We, we, we can't hear you, uh, dear Haney. Uh, please unmute yourself. Many thanks and very happy uh, to be with you, uh, do, my friend, Dr. Abdurrahman and uh, do, Dr. Uh, Mohammed Zahran. Uh, really uh, very happy to be with you and sharing uh, new guidelines about sports cardiology and real cases and uh, hoping this will be useful or beneficial to all audience. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dr. Henry. So, Dr. Yasser, uh, the stage is yours. Sharing. Uh, welcome uh, all attendants uh, of the CEC channel. Uh, welcome to the Muhammad Zahran, Dr. Hani. Uh, we'll tackle today the introductory part of uh, new uh, EEC guidelines on sports cardiology and exercise in patients with cardiovascular disease. Uh, first question, why do we need uh, new guidelines as regards sports cardiology? We know that uh, higher levels of physical activity and fitness is an integral therapy for most cardiovascular diseases and is associated with lower cardiovascular and all-cause mortality, lower rates of cardiovascular disease, and lower prevalence of several known malignancy. Indeed, there is a dose-effect relationship between exercise and cardiovascular and all-cause mortality, with a 20 to 30% reduction in adverse events compared with sedentary individuals. But on the other hand, exercise can paradoxically trigger life-threatening ventricular arrhythmias and sudden cardiac arrest in individuals with cardiovascular disease, especially previously sedentary or advanced cardiovascular disease. And indeed, uh, sudden cardiac death is the leading cause of sports and exercise-related mortality in athletes. So we have to, to know the benefit-risk paradox of uh, exercise. 
but what about the exercise related major adverse cardiac events? There are some facts we have to know about that the cardiovascular events is very rare. The cardiovascular events during intense exercise occur at a rate of around one event per 100 years of vigorous activity. And actually the risks are highest during the first few weeks of beginning vigorous exercise. And therefore both exercise intensity and duration should be increased gently, for example, every four weeks. Uh, also among all the individuals who are well prepared and accustomed to intense exercise, participation in competitive vigorous sports does not confer higher risk compared with younger adults. The exercise-related major adverse cardiac events entails sudden cardiac arrest and, and sudden cardiac death, exercise-induced acute coronary syndrome, transit ischemic attacks and cerebrovascular accident, and supraventricular tachycardia. What about sudden cardiac arrest and sudden cardiac death? What are the differences between both definitions? Sudden cardiac arrest is defined as an unexpected collapse due to a cardiac cause in which CPR and or defibrillation is provided in an individual regardless of a survival outcome, whether the individual did survive or, uh, or died. While sudden cardiac death is defined as sudden unexpected death due to a cardiac cause or sudden death in a structurally normal heart at autopsy with no other explanation for death and a history consistent with cardiac related death requiring uh, cardiac resuscitation. But what about the incidence of sudden cardiac death in athletes? It is very variable according to the definition, ranging from one every one million to one every 5,000. It is higher in males, higher in black athletes, higher in basketball and soccer in uh, Europe athletes. But we have to differentiate between young athletes and athletes beyond 35 years. Whereas the main uh, cause of Sudden cardiac death in young athletes is genetic, congenital, or autopsy negative sudden unexplained deaths. Whereas in athletes uh, beyond 35 years, atherosclerotic coronary artery disease is the main cause of uh, sudden cardiac death. It exceeds a, more than 80%, especially vigorous, with little or no background in systematic training. That's why. The, the arrangement of these guidelines differentiate between sudden cardiac death in young athletes where the main cause is genetic or congenital structural disorder, chanelopathies, autopsy negative sudden unexplained death syndrome. And here, pre-participation cardiovascular screening is controversial. What it is recommended by many experts to do history and physical examination or by ECG, uh, echocardiography may identify structural disorders. However, there is no sufficient evidence to recommend an echo or routine screening so far. Whilst in sudden cardiac death in older athletes, the cause is mainly uh, uh, due to atherosclerosis, coronary artery disease in more than 80%. So pre-participation cardiovascular screening, uh, exercise ECG testing should be reserved for symptomatic athletes or who are deemed uh, at high risk based on the scoring system of the European guidelines. Uh, here's the differentiation between uh, both categories, between sudden cardiac death in young competitive athletes. Below 35 years, we have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, coronary anomalies may account for about 60%, whereas beyond 35 years old, the coronary artery disease accounts for around 80% of the causes of sudden cardiac death. So we have to do pre-participation cardiovascular screening is being considered in these guidelines. So the, these new guidelines, they aim to minimize the risk of adverse events in highly trained athletes. In addition, as most exercising population are engaged in leisure sport and solo recreational exercise, and unlike elite athletes, they are at higher prevalence of risk factors for atherosclerotic and established cardiovascular disease. So the, the guidelines are uh, attempts to minimize the risk for uh, highly trained athletes and also for individuals undergoing recreational exercise or uh, not accustomed to exercise before. We have to go uh, and understand many definitions in order to understand these guidelines. What is physical activity? What's exercise training athletes? Uh, elite athletes, competitive athletes, recreational athletes, and 
sport disciplines. The first definition, what is the difference between physical activity and exercise? The physical activity is defined as any bodily movement produced by the skeletal muscle that results in energy expenditure. Whereas exercise or exercise training is physical activity that is structured, repetitive, and purposeful to improve or maintain one or more components of physical fitness. So the exercise is structured, repetitive, and purposeful. These are the components of the expression of the physical fitness, which is to improve the cardiorespiratory domain or morphological domain, muscular domain, metabolic domain in terms of glucose tolerance, lipid metabolism, or substrate oxidation, and motor domain. These are the components of the physical fitness. So what about uh, the athletes? The athlete, whether young or adult, amateur or professional, who is engaged in regular training and participates in official sports competition. They are uh, categorized according to these guidelines as suggested into elite athletes who are involved in the national teams, Olympians or professional who exercise more than or equal to 10 hours per week. What about competitive athletes in high school, college or master club level? Those who exercise more than or equal to six hours per week, but the recreational athletes for pleasure or leisure time who exercise more than or equal to four hours per week. So how to write an exercise prescription? We have to know the basic tenets of exercise uh, prescription. Uh, it involves, it is in the acronym, what's known as FIT. We have to uh, prescribe exercise in terms of frequency, num with a number of sessions per week and or bouts of session. The intensity of exercise, we will uh, uh, discuss this later on. Uh, the timing of exercise, the duration of a program, the type of exercise, whether endurance, running, cycling, or rowing, uh, strength or resistance training, or uh, flexibility training, or coordination and balance. Mode of exercise training, whether aerobic versus anaerobic or muscular work. What is the difference between aerobic exercise and anaerobic exercise? The aerobic exercise, these are the activities performed at, at low intensity, mainly due to aerobic glycolysis, or beside it, we can, invo can involve fat metabolism or beta oxidation. Whereas the anaerobic exercise, these are high intensity exercises to a limit unsustainable by oxygen delivery and to be processed mainly by anaerobic glycolysis. The aerobic exercise involving dynamic activities, whereas anaerobic exercise sustained isometric muscle action. The aerobic exercise, as we know, cycling, running, swimming, performed at low to moderate intensity, whereas the anaerobic exercise, it involves mainly intermittent high intensity exercise. So how to measure exercise intensity, how, how to assess that this activity is high intensity, moderate intensity or low intensity exercise. This is most critical. It's either assessed either in absolute intensity, the rate of energy expenditure during the exercise in terms of kilocalories per minute or minutes, as we do in the exercise test, as we all know, regardless uh, the individual doing the exercise. Whereas the relative exercise intensity refers to a fraction of the individual maximal power that's maintained during exercise. It is tailored according to the individual who performs the exercise. But basically, it is performed where available based on the cardiopulmonary exercise test, or uh, which is done by the maximal aerobic activity capacity, which is which known as the VO2 max, it can be also expressed as percentage of the maximal heart rate. But for example, if we did an exercise test and we started with uh, a basal heart rate of uh, around uh, 60 and we reach it 160, the heart rate maximum will be 160. And the, uh, the achieved exercise, it will be as a percentage of what achieved, for example, by uh, 120 over 160, around 70% of the maximal heart rate. Another way to assess it is as percentage of a person's heart rate reserve. From the same example, 
I started with a heart rate of 60 beat per minute and at the maximum exercise I achieved around 160. So the difference is regarded as the heart rate reserve, which is 160 minus 100 will be about 100. If I want to, an exercise to achieve around 40% of the heart rate reserve, so we I'll, I'll add uh, 60 plus 40 times 100, this is will be achieved as will be 100 beat per minute. It resembles it's around 40% of heart rate reserve. The intensity can be also monitored using the rate of perceived exertion scale, which is the Borg scale. For example, uh, uh, the talk test, I can uh, exercise without interruption of my talk or whether the exercise is so severe that it inter interrupts my talk. This is the definitions according to the previously men uh, mentioned uh, definitions. We can uh, divide the exercise testing into low intensity, moderate intensity, and high intensity, or very high intense exercise according to the previous definition. Whether VO2 max less than 40, from 40 to 70 percent, 70 to 85, or exceeding 85 percent. Heart rate uh, maximum, which is the same, heart rate reserve less than 40, 40 to 70 or 70 to 85 or beyond 85 or rate of, per, uh, of perceived exertion by Borg scale ranging from 10 up to 19. This is how we divide the intensity of the exercise or gauge the intensity of the exercise. What about the definition of the training volume? It is the product of the exercise intensity, for example, by METS, will and the duration. It is uh, suggested that the minimal activity will be around 1,000 kilocalories per week, as we see in many of our smart uh, watches or, or mobile applications, uh, how much kilocalorie we have burned per week, or about 10 minutes per hour per week. This is the minimal activity we need to achieve a minimal training volume and should be increased weekly by 2.5% or two minutes duration. So as we mentioned, we have aerobic uh, training and resistance training. These are the types of exercise. What we can say that the aerobic uh, training, we can uh, divide it into low, intermediate, moderate, or high intensity. What about resistance training? How to be described while weightlifting or weights? Is it uh, moderate or high intensity or what? It is prescribed in terms of one repetition maximum. This is the maximum amount of weight I can hold. I can, I can lift throughout a range of motion with one repetition. So I can lift in for a single time uh, 20 kilograms. This is what's known as one RM, one repetition maximum, or through five repetition maximum. This is the maximum amount of weight that can be performed five times, either one RM or five RM. Resistance training using less than 20% of one RM is generally considered aerobic endurance training. It is not, it's not a muscular training. If I exceeded 30 to 50%, 15 to 30 times, it is a muscular endurance training. To achieve a higher training intensity to gain strength in, in terms of muscle, I have to, uh, to carry I mean, from 50 to 70% to one RM with eight to 15 repetition. Why this occurs? Because more than 20% to one RM, the muscular capillaries becomes compressed and this drives a hypoxic stimulus responsible for the training effect. So to sum up, we have uh, uh, discussed the exercise prescription in terms of frequency, intensity, time, and type. We have aerobic exercises and anaerobic exercises as the de definition. How to measure the exercise intensity can be described either in absolute intensity or relative exercise intensity. And this is the divisions or categorization of the exercise intensity. And how we measure the resistance training in terms of one repetition motion. Uh, repetition maximum, I'm sorry, one repetition maximum, one RM. And these are the sports disciplines of all the categorization or for, different sports. Some sport depends on the skill and this minimal affects the heart rate or blood pressure, such as uh, uh, golf, sailing, shooting, table tennis. These are skill 
sports. Power sports mainly we are uh, weightlifting or wrestling. Other uh, endurance exercise that maximally uh, has a maximum effect on how in terms of heart rate or uh, heart rate. Uh, cardiac output or volume of training and cardiac remodeling, such as mid to long distance swimming, running, skating, and some, uh, some sports, a combination of both power and endurance, in, uh, like football, tennis, volleyball, or water pool. But these guidelines uh, made a new addition to uh, this categorization. We have to know what is low, what is medium, what is high, in order not to go through uh, many sports, so we have to know which is high intensity sports. But high intensity sports is weightlifting, wrestling, boxing. These are the high intensity power sports. Other sports like uh, competitive football, competitive basketball, competitive handball, or single tennis, these are high intensity sports. As you got endurance, we have pentathlon or uh, biathlon, homesi, thunei, thulesi, uh, the long, uh, other long distance skating. These are the high intensity sports that you have to screen before uh, undergoing uh, these uh, exercises. What about, uh, uh, well, oh, but some, uh, some like the tennis uh, double ball, we are medium intensity exercises. Uh, just jogging, it is a low intensity exercise. So to sum up, we did, we can categorize uh, sports into different, uh, whether skill, power, endurance, or mixed. The high intensity sports, we are the wrestling, weightlifting, competitive football, basketball, handball, uh, uh, hockey, fencing, uh, long distance skating, uh, Olympic sports, these are the high intensity sports. We, uh, in the previous section, we have discussed different uh, definitions for our athletes, different types of exercises. Here we come to the exercise recommendation in three categories, in healthy individuals, in risk groups, or in the elderly. What about the exercise recommendation in healthy individuals without any cardiovascular disease or cardiovascular risk? As we all have mentioned before, there is a dose effect relationship between exercise and cardiovascular and all cause mortality. So the European guidelines recommends that healthy adults of all ages should perform a minimum of 150 minutes of moderate intensity endurance exercise training over five days or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise per week over three days, with additional benefit derived by doubling the amount to 300 minutes moderate intensity or 150 minutes of vigorous intensity aerobic physical activity per week. And these are the recommendations, uh, class one level of evidence A, as regards whether minimum 150 moderate or 75 vigorous and to be in gradual increase to 300 moderate or 150 vigorous intense aerobic exercise is recommended for all healthy adults. With multiple sessions of exercise spread throughout the week on four to five days a week and preferably every day of the week are recommended and regular assessment to promote adherence and support in terms of increase in the exercise volume over time are recommended. Second, We'll discuss the exercise recommendations in risk groups. This is the proposed general algorithm for cardiovascular ass uh, assessment in asymptomatic individuals aged beyond 35 years and possible subclinical uh, coronary, coronary syndrome, what we have to, uh, to screen for before engaging in sports. First of all, we have to ask ourselves two questions. What is the cardiovascular disease risk? And what is the intensity of the physical activity I'm going to practice? If my cardiovascular disease risk is low, and also I am physically, that means that I have no 
cardiovascular risk factor at all. I am not hypertensive or diabetic, and I am physically active. I don't know, want to do, do any further investigation or no, there is no restriction at all. Whereas if I have a high cardiovascular risk, whether I have one or more cardiovascular risk factors, or I am having as leading a sedentary life, I, had, I took the decision to undergo uh, physical activity or exercise, I can ask about the intensity of the physical activity. If low or, inter or intermediate, I will not do any further investigations, no other restrictions. If it is high or very high physical activity, as we have discussed before, the high uh, intensity physical activity, I have to do a risk assessment by medical history, physical examination, score, and by ECG. If we are normal, no further investigations or restrictions are deemed necessary. If abnormal, I have to do a maximum exercise test. Or if there is a very high cardiovascular risk, I can do functional imaging or coronary CT. If revealed high risk feature, I will go for an invasive coronary angiography. And these are the recommendations and class of evidences for uh, individuals beyond 35 years who have with low to moderate cardiovascular disease risk, the participation of all recreational sports should be considered without further cardiovascular evaluation. And when I have to do for competitive athletes, uh, I have to do cardiac screening with family history, symptoms, physical examination, and 12 lead resting ECG. And but I, if I am a sedentary one or individuals with high or very high cardiovascular risk, I, I undergoing an intense exercise program or competitive sport, I will do a maximal exercise test, which is a stress test. In other very high risk individuals, I can do the coronary CT and geography or functional imaging can be resorted to. And this is. Uh, the, 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 the risk stratification as uh, highlighted in previous guidelines, whether I have very high risk individuals with established cardiovascular disease, if I am diabetic with target organ damage, severe CKD, score risk beyond 10% or, or family history of atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. Also, we have to stress if I am type 1 diabetic patient, with long duration beyond 20 years, I am at very high risk. High risk individuals, be high, a single elevated risk uh, factor, uh, like LDL cholesterol beyond 190, or blood pressure exceeding 180 over 110, post family history, diabetes, diabetes without target organ uh, damage, with diabetes exceeding 10 years, moderate CKD, or risk score uh, uh, between 5 to 10%, and other moderate risk patients uh, like type 1 diabetes mellitus without with duration less than 10 years or score between 1 and 5 and low risk uh, with calculated score less than 1%. This is for individuals, healthy individuals beyond 35 years age. What about uh, exercising in an obese patients? Do I have benefit? Yes, we have a benefit in terms of reduction of intra-abdominal fat, increase in the muscle and bone mass, attenuation of weight loss induced decline of resting energy expenditure, reduction of blood pressure, uh, improvement in glucose tolerance and lipid profile, uh, uh, positive influence on maintenance of weight reduction, effect, a positive effect on well-being and reduction in anxiety and depression. What about exercising in patient with hypertension. Do I have a benefit in terms of blood pressure reduction? Yes. M moderate intensity uh, dynamic aerobic exercise for five to seven days per week. And can I have a, re a mean reduction in systolic blood pressure of seven millimeter mercury and diastolic blood pressure of five millimeter mercury with further additional resistance training will be highly effective and further blood pressure reduction. So we have an additional benefit here in terms of resistant exercise, whether in obese patients and or hypertensive patients. But what about uh, antihypertensive treatment? 
Number one, beta blockers are prohibited in certain competitive sports as shooting because we induce bradycardia and may cause a negative effect on the exercise tolerance. Number two, diuretics are prohibited in all competitive sports. So patients with hypertension undergoing competitive sports, I will not prescribe for them diuretics. And the drugs of choice will be ACE inhibitor, ARBs and calcium channel blockers are the preferred drugs of choice. Non-selected non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs for musculoskeletal pain may raise blood pressure, so we have to take them cautiously. If blood pressure is uncontrolled, we, I have to temporarily restrict the patient or the individual from undergoing competitive sports except for skill sports. Also, when blood pressure is controlled in high-risk patients with hypertension-mediated organ damage, I have to avoid weight lifting. These are some precautions we have to take in hypertensive patients contemplating uh, under, uh, do, uh, doing exercise uh, training. What about exercise and dyslipidemia? The exercise can reduce triglycerides up to 50% and increase HDL by 5 to 10%. However, its effect on LDL is very minimal. So with reduction by up to 5%, we shift of atherogenic small dense LDL to larger LDL particles in a dose dependent fashion. So we have to take our uh, uh, statin medications regardless of the effect of exercise because the effect of exercise is very minimal on LDL. Also, patients with significant dyslipidemia and a high LDL level who are deemed at high or very high risk, I can do functional imaging tests or CT, coronary angiography in the risk assessment, particularly in individuals with familial hypercholesterolemia. Also, we have to take care of the side effects of statins in terms of muscle pain and sores or tendinopathy, and we can switch to another either to another statin or use uh, other lipid lowering agents like ezetimibe or PCSK9 inhibitors. Also, individuals who develop rhabdomyolysis due to a statin during exercise should pres be prescribed another lipid lowering agent. The last uh, risk category we'll discuss today, uh, today will be the diabetes mellitus. The physical inactivity is a major cause of type 2 diabetes mellitus and the risk of developing type 2 diabetes is 50 to 80% higher in individuals who are physically inactive compared to their active counterparts. Therefore, patients with prediabetes or metabolic syndrome, both aerobic and resistance exercise, may prevent the development of overt diabetes. And also diabetes is an independent uh, association with the accelerated decline in the muscular strength. And uh, due to hyperglycemia, uh, may lead to reduced joint mobility. So the, the beneficial effects of exercise in pre-diabetes or metabolic syndrome may prevent the development of over-diabetes. And also exercising in diabetic patients may improve glycemic control, improve insulin resistance, beneficial effects on blood pressure, lipid profile, and modest weight loss. And also some observational studies have shown lower mortality in both type one and type 2 diabetes compared to the sedentary people, uh, diabetic patients. And what's important is the intensity of exercise seems to be of greater importance than the volume of the exercise. It is not the matter of the duration, it is the intensity. So individuals who exercise at moderate or high intensity have a lower risk of the developing of metabolic impairment. And because the effect of exercise, it improves the skeletal muscle uptake uh, of the glucose by uh, a glucose independent manner. And by time it, it enhances this pathway uh, and this leads to uh, a, hypo a favorable effect in terms of hypoglycemia. So individuals with diabetes should undergo cardiovascular assessment before taking up an exercise program of high intensity, as we have mentioned before, because we have one risk uh, factor over uh, considered at a high risk or very high risk 
to undergo exercise, uh, cardiovascular uh, risk. So when uh, attempting to do high intensity exercise, we have to, to do a, a proper cardiovascular assessment in addition to glycemic status evaluation to avoid the presence of hypoglycemia. So we have to assess risk factors for hypoglycemia, history of hypoglycemic episodes, presence of autonomic polyneuropathy and anti-diabetic treatment before doing the exercise. And these are the considerations and recommendations in patients with either obesity, dyslipidemia, hypertension, or diabetes. But, but we have to know the added to the endurance exercises, we added aerobic exercise resistance training in whether in obese patients, well-controlled hypertensive patients, as we, uh, we repeat again, well-controlled hypertension, resistance training, also in individuals with diabetes mellitus, resistance training, we have class one level of evidence A in addition to the aerobic exercise training, whether moderate or vigorous, moderate or vigorous. However, in patients with well-controlled hypertension, but high risk or, and or target organ damage, high intensity resistance exercise is not recommended. So patients with hypertension with high risk or target organ damage, avoid weight lifting. Also in individuals with systolic blood pressure, uncontrolled, exceeding 160, you have to avoid doing high intensity exercise until blood pressure is being well controlled. Lastly, in this section, we will discuss exercise recommendation in the elderly patient beyond 65 years. The same applies, but we have to take care about arrhythmias, increase in blood pressure, myocardial ischemia, muscular risk of muscular injuries and fractures or folds, uh, or muscle or joint pains. However, otherwise, the same applies. P uh, uh, adults 65 years or old who are fit with no health conditions that limit their mobility, here but, uh, we have to do moderate intense, not vigorous, moderate for at least 150 minutes per week. This is the only difference. Uh, avoided vigorous, we avoided 300 minutes per week. Uh, we have recommending at least 150 minutes per week, class one level of evidence A. And we have to add some strength training exercises to improve balance and coordination to and avoid falls. Also, we have to uh, do a full clinical assessment in sedentary adults uh, aged 65 or more uh, participating in high intensity activity. However, in individuals who are accustomed to doing high and very high intensity activity, including in competitive sports, may be considered in asymptomatic elderly affiliates at low or moderate cardiovascular risk. This is the exercise prescription, aerobic work, strength training is recommended and exercise for flexibility and balance. But how we can uh, prescribe to our elderly patient to do some exercises uh, in terms of effort, moderate effort activities like walking, like doing, can exercise double tennis, volleyball, water aerobics. What about the age-related intense effort activities will be running, jogging, aerobics, single tennis, football, uh, energetic dancing. These are the intense effort activities. And these are the moderate. Moderate like walking is safe, double tennis is safe, volleyball is safe for them. What about the muscle strengthening activities, carrying or moving heavy loads, doing uh, groceries activities that involve stepping and jumping, and as well as weightlifting, uh, doing heavy gardening such as digging or shoveling. This is the muscle strengthening activities. Some of them we can prescribe to our elderly patients. So take home messages for this section, what to do or what not to do in healthy individuals. And we can do, uh, recommend at least 150 minutes per week of moderate intensity or 75 minutes per week of vigorous intense aerobic exercise or equivalent combination thereof is recommended in all healthy adults. And we have to instruct them and enhance increase in exercise volume and to be done throughout uh, most days of the week, four to five days a week, and preferably every day of the week. This is class one recommendation. 
What about special con uh, consideration for individuals with obesity, hypertension, dyslipidemia, or diabetes? We can add resistance training more than or equal three times per week. Whether for obese, well-controlled hypertension, and also diabetes mellitus. Whereas individuals with uncontrolled hypertension with blood pressure beyond uh, systolic, beyond 160 millimeter mercury, high intensity exercise is not recommended until blood pressure has been controlled. What about recommendation for the aging individuals you know, who are fit and no health condition, limit their mobility, moderate intensity aerobic exercise for at least 150 uh, minutes per week is recommended. In all the, uh, and all patients who are at risk of falls, we can add to them some strength training exercises to improve balance and coordination on at least two days a week. I recommend these are the wrap up of the previous section for the recommendation for healthy individuals, uh, patients with risk factors like obesity, hypertension, diabetes, or dyslipidemia, and aging individuals. And thank you for the end of this part one and uh, the will be completed by uh, our professor, Dr. Hani Shahid. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Yasser, uh, for this comprehensive uh, introduction. Let's say this is an introduction to the approach. Uh, Dr. Yasser's lecture included, uh, let's say, uh, three parts. The first part was the definitions, the different definitions for the maximum oxygen consumption, for the exercise loads, for the intensity, for the power, for the endurance, and classification of the different types of sports according to these definitions, which is a little bit uh, must know before you tackle these guidelines for sports cardiology. And then the second part, for me, it is the most important part for the decision making. It's more or less like the clinical assessment of a patient undergoing a non-cardiac surgery. You need to ask yourself two questions. What is the risk of the patient and what is the risk of the surgery? In the sports, you need to ask yourself two questions. What is the cardiovascular risk of the individual? And what is the cardiovascular risk or what is the intensity or the cardiovascular risk of the sport? So when you balance the two or you make a match in the equation between the patient or the individual participating, whether he does not have any risk at all or whether he's low risk or intermediate or high risk, and then you match this with the type of competitive sports that he's going to perform, whether it is a low or intermediate or high intensity sport, then you get what is the next step, which will range between, uh, of course, in all cases, a history and examination, which will be followed by simple ECG and echo in some cases, and in high risk cases or high risk individuals going to a high intensity sport, you can reach an invasive coronary angiogram to assess the situation. And this here is very important to match your patient to the type of physical exercise that he's going to perform. And then at the end or the last one third of Dr. Yester's lecture, he was discussing with us special situations like the relationship between exercise and hypertension, exercise and obesity, exercise and diabetes, exercise in the elderly. So actually, in all those cases, it is well known that exercise is beneficial in all situations, but needed to be start in a graded approach. And before you prescribe the dose of the exercise, if we can use the term, the dosage of the exercise, you need to assess the risk of the patient or the individual again. And here we go to the middle part of the lecture, which is actually the most important part regards the decision making. Uh, Dr. Abrahman, do you have any uh, comments to add or questions to ask for Dr. Yasser before we pass the mic to Dr. Haney? Uh, thank you, uh, dear Zahran. Uh, actually, I want uh, to thank uh, my dear uh, brother and friend, uh, Professor Dr. Yasser Ali. Uh, very elegant talk and very illustrative. Um, I think uh, uh, the, da the data is uh, uh, or are so clear. I want to ask only uh, uh, one question regarding the target uh, heart rate uh, or the heart rate should be, shouldn't be exceeded uh, during exercise. Uh, either, uh, I know that uh, you explained it very well, but please 
if you can uh, go back to uh, that slide uh, regarding the calculation of uh, uh, either by the maximal maximal heart rate uh, uh, traditional way that we used to uh, to use it to calculate the maximal heart rate during uh, our um, uh, ordinary uh, exercise testing or uh, using uh, the uh, heart rate reserve um, or the uh, more accurate uh, uh, way to uh, to uh, calculate the maximal uh, aerobic capacity. So the practical uh, uh, way to calculate the heart rate shouldn't be exceeded during exercise, either for uh, individuals more than 35 years old or for uh, those uh, uh, more than 65 years old. I'm talking about the healthy individuals uh, uh, beginning or starting the, uh, their exercise. Thanks, uh, Dr. Abdurrahman, for your uh, elegant question, but I have to highlight uh, that these classifications or this categorization for the exercise intensity was deemed to categorize the level of exercise. If we use the heart, uh, we have low intensity, moderate intensity, and high intensity based of the way you are measuring the uh, whether by the most accurate uh, cardiopulmonary exercise test, if the exercise achieved is less than 40 percent with a low intensity, we can go to the moderate intensity or high intensity, which is the vigorous exercise. Uh, if which is most useful, more useful, and if we are talking or we are doing the cardiac rehabilitation, uh, in cardiac rehabilitation, uh, when we assess the, the patient and doing exercise test uh, at baseline, we can, can we get uh, the, if we have a cardiopulmonary exercise test, we can calculate the VO2 max and tailor the exercise prescription later on, starting by uh, less than 40, then uh, moving after four weeks to uh, the moderate intensity level, then switching to the high intensity level. Uh, this is uh, uh, after four weeks. But if we use the heart rate maximum, we can adjust according to the achieved maximum heart rate, but we actually are using the heart rate uh, reserve. As we have highlighted, uh, if I used the exercise test, a baseline heart rate is 60, and I reached my maximum uh, heart rate was 160, so the difference will be about 100. So if I want to start the patient on a low intensity exercise at first, I will start, uh, I will uh, maintain at a heart rate of 100 beat per minute. Then actually gradually increasing uh, for the next uh, uh, four weeks, for example, in the, in, the, in the second month in the cardiac rehabilitation to ranging from 40 to 69 to reach around, uh, around heart rate of 120 beat per minute. If I am doing on the uh, treadmill. But when I want to increase the exercise to a high intensity, I would reach 80% of heart rate reserve, reaching around 140 beat per minute, and I maintain the patient for uh, the, the third month if he can tolerate upon this heart rate. I don't have a maximum heart rate for a healthy individual or an older individual, but this is the level I can uh, describing the intensity of the exercise the patient is doing. For the elderly patient, uh, what's recommended is to, to be in the moderate intensity exercise. This is actually uh, enough for, for the elderly patients, whereas in the healthy individuals with risk factors like diabetic patient or hypertension, I can reach the, the vigorous exercise level, which is achieved by 7 to 85%. Other way of talking, the high intensity uh, level is achieved by high intensity sports, as I've mentioned before. Thanks a lot, uh, dear uh, Dr. Yasser. Uh, that is the point uh, I, I want you actually to stress on uh, how, how we can calculate uh, the heart rate reserve. And thank you for uh, uh, elegantly illustrating this uh, point. Hello, can I have a question to, uh, to, to Dr. Yasser? I'm Haitham Suleiman. Of course, of course, I am going, please. 
Thank you, Esther, for this elegant presentation. Uh, I want to have your personal opinion about uh, professional uh, uh, sports or uh, athletes with hypertension. These patients have a vague uh, clue to uh, target organ damage uh, induced by hypertension. Uh, some of them are already having uh, the normal hypertrophy of the athlete's heart uh, and uh, uncontrolled hypertension, especially if they are uh, in their late 20s or uh, 30s. So how can I differentiate between this athlete heart and uh, changes due to hypertension, especially if uh, the hypertension is moderate because this will affect my recommendation for them to stop their competitive sports or stop uh, weight lifting. So um, what's your opinion about this vague group of patients? The patients with athlete heart that got hypertension and I cannot differentiate between this is a normal hypertrophy or physiological hypertrophy or hypertrophy due to the hypertension. Uh, thanks, Dr. Heisen, for the question. This is a question uh, with some arguments uh, to claim whether the athlete heart of hypertrophy is uh, due to the uh, uncontrolled blood pressure or uh, whether it is due to uh, the training uh, of the weightlifting he is doing. Uh, actually, we can depend upon other factors, like whether his blood pressure, we can monitor his blood pressure, whether it is controlled uh, or not. Uh, it is suggested also by the guidelines to monitor uh, with microalbuminuria or not. We can assess also the, uh, the other, uh, other uh, factors, like if he has a diastolic dysfunction, this is with uh, he has a pathological hypertrophy rather than uh, uh, physiological hypertrophy. If we can find the stroke dysfunction grade one, this is with uh, the LVH due to uh, hypertension rather than phys physiologic hypertrophy, he will have normal diastolic uh, function. Uh, blood pressure is controlled or not. Uh, but the guidelines here stresses upon the, the control of blood pressure. If we have a blood pressure is controlled, he can continue. Uh, if he has uh, target organ, then hypertension mediated organ damage. We cannot say due to uh, LVH alone, which will be uh, argumentary uh, viewpoint. We will depend upon other factors, uh, whether microalbuminuria is present or not. Uh, he has uh, suggested by guidelines other uh, uh, rate, uh, fundus examination, the uh, retinal, uh, uh, if the retinal capillaries are affected or not. This um, uh, I think will be uh, uh, what determines uh, whether to recommend this or not. Thank you. So uh, your opinion and the recommendation of guidelines not to depend upon the presence of LVH alone, but upon the um, effect of uh, hypertension on the heart collectively, LVH and diastolic functions, and the uh, uh, accompanying uh, signs and symptoms of other organ-mediated damage due to hypertension. Yes, I think so. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Haysam, for raising this important point. Uh, if uh, hypertension uh, is causing an LVH, and this is the hypertensive effect from the heart, so you will have an LVH in association with a series of other problems also, which Dr. Yasser uh, pointed at, uh, including the effect on the kidneys, the effect on the on the retina, and so on, but also the diastolic dysfunction, and also the new parameters for assessing the diastolic function, uh, the tissue doctor imaging, the strain, and the strain rate would also detect a subtle subclinical actually effects on the diastolic dysfunction rather than a simple calculation of the muscle volume or the muscle mass. So this is uh, very important and also it will be involved, I think, in the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy versus the athlete heart. So uh, I think now it's nearly 